Sorry. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Awesome. So thank you. So uh, we're here with the Green Program, Winter 2021, our first program in over just about two years. So this is our Learn Now, Travel Later group. And we've, over the last seven days, have been working hard um, learning about uh, sustainable energy innovation here in Iceland and how we could take that from Iceland and around the world and also in what uh, in each of our passion, passions in what we do. We have a great group of students here. And from the first day we met to where we are today, we've learned so much about each other and different things. And I'm so excited to hear about all your different ideas from where they started to where they are today. And each one is so diverse and really shows each, uh, each person's passion. So I'm excited for that. And I think you should all give each other a round of applause for the work you're doing. And I'm so excited to see uh, what you all do. So you'll give a 15 minute presentation for five minutes of questions. Uh, we'll give you a five minute warning, a two minute warning, and an in conclusion warning. <laughs> and then sadly at that point, we will have to cut you off. But I'm excited to see what you all do. And I know you do a great job. So one more round of applause, and you're good. So, so thank you for that. We're extra special that way. So thank you for the honor of going first. We did win um, rock, paper, scissors. Thank you, Shabesh. Um, so for our project, um, first I'm going to introduce us, and then we'll get right into our project. So my name's Sarah. My name is Aaron. My name is also Sarah. I'm Jess. I'm Shubesh. And I'm Neha. Yes, and our project is on community-based pollution and we focused on ecological education. All right, so the basis of our project was to educate and empower local communities to learn more about the pollution going on in their community as well as how it affects them and the local species. Um, we specifically focused on um, the environment as well as animal and human species and um, the ecosystem as our area is a wet, in a wetland environment. Um, we specifically focused also on local methane pollution, which is the um, emission that we chose to focus our specific case study around. And then this pollution is coming from the Carvel Energy Center, which is a power plant in um, Louisiana. Uh, in addition to that, we focused on the byproduct effect on the health and well-being of the community as a whole. So as I said, our community that we focused on was St. Gabriel, Louisiana, which is a small town along the Mississippi. Um, we centered our project out of a community center as just a basis of um, culture in the city. And a lot of people come in and out of there in, um, who are involved within the community. Um, so we partnered with local volunteers in the center, trusted um, educators in the community so we could have a more personal connection. And we also focused on schooling systems, such as the local high schools, um, colleges, and as well as some elementary schools, just to get um, the children of the future, or the children involved in the future of their community. We also brought in an aspect of science called citizen science, which is where an individual is able to go out and collect data on a wide scale, so anybody can go out and do it, and collect these um, emissions of methane. So we had sensors that detected um, methane and showed if it was above the legal limit. Um, and then we would use this um, uh, data from the methane uh, readers to analyze the data and then compile kind of a community um, database to show the, where the emissions, are, emissions excuse me, are highest and where um, what communities are affected the most. So kind of a goal out of this was to affect policy and legislation in the local area as well as potentially in other communities um, to just change energy laws to be a little bit more sustainable. And then for the next part, our why, or why we are doing this project, we're trying to combat environmental injustice among communities. So the specific community we focused on has a very, or is very low in their socioeconomic status, um, as well as has a high population of BIPOC individuals. So we are trying to equip these people with the power and with the education to um, defend themselves against um, di uh, disproportionate rates of climate change. Um, we're also trying to hold leaders accountable and then as everybody is progressed towards a greener future. So for our sustainable goals, um, the ones we focused on, we just pulled three out, as many of your projects probably do. They apply to many of the goals. But overall, focused on good health and well-being, 
um, as well as quality education, because we believe everyone should have an access to quality education, as well as reduced inequalities, which ties into the socioeconomic piece and focusing on communities that are impoverished. So now a little bit on the why that we chose the St. Gabriel community in Louisiana. So just a bit of background, this town is actually located in a strip known as Cancer Alley. It's an 85 mile strip that runs from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to New Orleans, where there's been a history of intense um, disproportionate environmental injustices caused from an, an, an enormous amount of power plants in the areas. And then in addition, um, there was a long history of coal in this region up until this specific natural gas power plant, the Carville Energy Center, came into fruition in 1998. And so just a bit of the stacks, stats about, about the town is that the local population is about 7,200 and more than half of that population is located within three miles of this power plant. In addition, the percentage of people living in low income um, is about 51% and about 71%, so almost three quarters of the community identifies as BIPOC. And then as well, we also said that we are focusing specifically on methane. And we decided that mainly because with the rise in natural gas in the US, which has thankfully led to reduced carbon emissions from shutting down coal factories, this has also led to a lot of places having um, different kinds of methane leaks that have largely gone undetected in the US. And also methane is a greenhouse gas that is incredibly potent in the atmosphere, but it does actually have the benefit of having a short lifespan in the atmosphere, which means that any work that we do, we will see immediate impacts um, in terms of environmental health and uh, well-being for people as well. And then on the other side of things, outside of the methane um, detection and the natural gas and air pollution part, we're also focusing on the fact that this town has a really um, incredible wetland aspect to it. So wetlands, as many people might know, are um, really crucial to biodiversity. They maintain the stability in the town through um, natural disaster mitigation, which is crucial, especially in Louisiana, which faces a ton of natural disaster risk. Um, in addition, they have water purification aspects in an enormous amount of fish, mammal, bird species that allow the ecosystem to thrive from its biodiversity. And also, a little known fact, in case nobody knew this one, they do emit a little bit of methane already, um, which keeps the ecosystem in balance. And so another reason why we wanted to focus on the methane in this community is that the balance is so delicate given the slippages that could happen from this natural gas power plant that we need to maintain a healthy level of that. And then just for an overview so you guys get a bit of a, a sense and um, image of where we're talking about. So as you can see, the Mississippi River bends around here. This is the town of St. Gabriel. We have the Carville Energy Center on the bottom and then St. Gabriel, Communi uh, Gabriel Community Center at the very top and then the elementary school uh, very in close proximity to the power plant. And the driving distance from the community center to the energy center is about 10 minutes. So very close in proximity. So the type of intervention that we're looking to create would be a community education program within the community center in St. Gabriel. And the three main pillars that the education program would focus on, first would be educating the citizens on the pollution in their local area. The second would be the local species and ecosystem services in their area and kind of to see how the two things are connected. And then finally, it would be a citizen science project where if you don't know what that is, it's kind of just widespread data collection that anyone and everyone can do. So it's very effective in getting accurate results because it's just so large. And then the byproduct of that would be the citizens are able to see how the methane in their area not only affects their health, but the health of the ecosystem that they live in. And then in a little bit more detail, the education program, we thought it would be important to have the educator be someone that they know and trust, preferably someone from their community, because people tend to get a little bit more skeptical if it's someone they don't know coming into their town and preaching to them about things they should do and change and so on. And then we were looking to partner with a nonprofit with similar values. That way they could assist in kind of the education material portion. And again, the education would focus on local pollutants, local species, local ecosystem services. And then more about the citizen science project. Our first goal would be to obtain a 
main methane sensor that would be located at the community center that would be constantly tracking the emissions. And then we would like to get some smaller handheld sensors that people could grab and take from the community center, go wherever they would like in the community, whether that be their home, their school, their favorite park, whatever it may be, see what the emissions are there, and then go back to the community center where we would ideally have a big map. They could put a pinpoint where they got their emissions, what they were, and then once they've done that for a while, they could look at the overall rates in different locations and kind of analyze where they're higher and what that might mean for the local environment for where they're higher or where they live, what that means for their health and so on. And then the community leaders would be the ones kind of assisting and helping them analyze that. And then also we thought it would be important to incorporate the leaders helping them write to their local representatives to ask for change because I think a lot of people don't realize that they have the power to do that and then also writing to the power plant to hold them accountable for their emissions. This project will have four main categories of key resources. The first being, of course, office space to house our program. So we will be housed in the St. Gabriel Community Center, and this is where our interns, volunteers, college students, elementary students, whoever we come to educate, will be gathered, and this is also where um, our central hub of data collection, synthesizing, and analyzing will all be going on. We'll also need technology, of course. As we mentioned before, we'll have one main sensor located in that community center, and that will be continuously updating and gathering new information, so we have a constant record. We'll also have the smaller handheld sensors for our volunteers and interns to get the more pinpoint data collection in specific areas of the community and eventually all of the community will hopefully be monitored pretty well about the different levels there. And then we'll also have binoculars, field guides, things like that for a more hands-on educational aspect of the program. Next, a very, very key aspect of this program are our partnerships with key stakeholders. Firstly, local nonprofits, specifically the Sierra Club Delta chapter, which have been environmental stewards in this area in the past. Also, the Louisiana Environmental Action Network, the Native Plant Society, and the Nature Conservancy. We'll also be um, reaching out to private foundations, specifically the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, who are known to support and fund to small organizations and projects like ours, who are actively working to quicken the switch to clean energy. Also government funded grants, specifically from the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality and the EPA. Um, we delved a little bit more into what fund or what grant we could apply to, and we found the Air and Ecosystem Research Grants, which we think will work really well for our project since we're both monitoring air quality and also ecosystem education and awareness and how those things intersect. And then also we'll be reaching out to Louisiana universities and colleges for gathering interns, seeing anyone's passion about this project, things like that. <laughs> and then to reach these audiences, we'll obviously be going in person to these universities and schools. We'll be sending our um, local leaders to things like churches, schools, things like that, to um, see if any volunteers or people passionate about this have interest in joining us and potentially going around with those handheld sensors and collecting data for us. And then, of course, we'll also be using social media, things like Facebook and Instagram to reach out to even widen reach, in, reach our audiences. All right, next we'll be going into cost and the financial aspects of our project. And so we plan to function as a nonprofit in partnership with the local community center. As we mentioned, that would be St. Gabriel Community Center. Um, most of our funding would come from, like just mentioned, grants and donations from other nonprofits or other, in, other environmental organizations uh, that find value in the work that we do. And then just breaking down our biggest costs that we see, one would be like education and then space, and that would be like the office space, whether we would need to like rent it, also provide office supplies, things like that. It would be in advertising through social media or billboards and posters, um, and then 
our main like technology that we need would be the large readers. And so one large reader to be in the community center and then also the smaller methane sensors that the community members can take out with them. And so going into what we would like our long-term goals to be, so our first and biggest goal is lessened pollution over time, as well as just an increase in community involvement um, in environmental standards. And so as the community becomes more aware of the methane levels and kind of sees what that effect is on their health and their children, the plant and you know, animal wildlife, they can begin to understand uh, the intersection of like local laws and how that may not be helping them and also begin to advocate for themselves um, as they become more knowledgeable in environmental standards. And then another big goal we have is reduced overall financial impact on larger systems like healthcare, government assistance programs. Uh, something that I've heard before is it's very expensive to be poor and so if you don't have clean water or clean air um, you're going to spend more time in the hospital, you're going to spend more time getting medication. And so as the air pollution hopefully decreases and we you know, reduce um, the power plant um, kind of system in that area, we'll see you know, less people hopefully um, going into these assistance programs, spending less time in the hospital, less time taking medications, things like that. Um, we also would like to help power companies avoid litigation through citizen involvement in enforcing these environmental standards. And then lastly, as we grow and the idea in the community grows, um, we plan to expand our project to other locations in that Cancer Alley strip that we mentioned, and then also in communities outside of um, Cancer Alley in the, as well. And then, like I mentioned, we do plan to function um, as a nonprofit, so we don't expect too much surplus, because uh, we won't have a ton of revenue. But, if we do, we plan to invest in more sensors. When we were doing our research, we noticed that they were quite expensive. Uh, and then also just be grateful and thankful to our community leaders and interns and pay them for their time, as well as donate, donate back to the community as viable and as needed and as we see um, what they need. And then eventually, like I mentioned, expand to even more communities to kind of raise awareness in other parts, not only for nuclear power plants or other power plants in general, general but you know, all types of pollution. And then lastly, create an app that consolidates the data that people have collected in different places over time um, to improve accessibility of environmental education. So moving on from financial, financial considerations, um, one of our main goals was to minimize environmental as well as ethical impacts and keep them at the lowest levels. Um, we believe that um, sustainability and access to quality education should not be just a privilege of the rich and that everyone deserves the right to environmental education and the area, the env environmental community that affects them. This is the first step towards moving to a green economy and um, this will eventually lead to building community res resiliency and understanding. And of course, lessening the pollution levels will eventually lead to uh, better health and well-being of the whole community, as well as the living organisms that are there. Looking at the different levels of the sustainability complex diagram, ours stands at the community and, uh, community and neighborhood level but we hope to expand in both directions as the community talks to each other and we get more grants from the nonprofits. And we would like to end with a quote that is really relevant to our project. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. As we all know, we've never seen this quote before. No idea where it came from. <laughs> but we did feel it was applicable as well. Um, thank you. We hope you guys are excited about our project as we are, and we're excited to see yours as well. So thanks. At this time, we have questions. five minutes for questions and answers. Shoot, guys, go uh, for it. Does anyone have a question at this time? Because I imagine some of us do. And if it's a specific question about a specific slide, I can just pass it off to whoever that person okay. was. 
I could start. Yeah, go for it. Oh, do I have it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what do you see as being your biggest challenge with this idea? As a group, you've worked, and each one of you has looked at different things, but collectively, what do you see as the biggest challenge uh, for implementing this idea in the community? Uh, personally, so this is not something we've we fleshed out challenges to our project in general, like legal issues, um, societal issues. But the biggest issue is just, t I think, proving the efficacy of this project. So proving that it is important to educate yourself about your surroundings, proving that um, knowing about your community is important and that it does have an active effect on your life as well as your children's life. So I would say um, getting involvement in the project could be one of our biggest challenges. If anybody else has something they'd like to present, yeah, of course. I also think one of our main challenges would just be acquiring the sensors because they are very expensive and especially initially it would be difficult to get grants and stuff like that. Maybe once the project has moved forward a little bit it would be more plausible to have several of them, but definitely right off the bat, it would be hard to have a lot of expensive sensors. Okay. Is there any more? You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna? Yeah, that was awesome, guys. Um, one thing I was wondering, just like clarifying, so when you're saying like kind of like one large sensor at the community center, like I'm just, just wanting to clarify that it's like, so reading like methane emissions and stuff, just like in like the closest proximity to the community center. I can take this one. Um, we were imagining it to be connected to the community center and just doing the surrounding area because it was a good vantage point based on the map of just being that 10 minute drive away from the power plant in a pretty central location in the community to get an average read. Um, and then also it would be connected to our map that would be updating in live time as it's connected to um, the sensor to show the concentrations at any given instant of um, what it looks like in the community at that time on average. So we wanted a central hub because we wanted to have the consistency aspect because the citizen science component is going to be not as frequent as the larger sensor that's taking it in in every millisecond. Yeah, because no, that was my main question with that. Yeah, I think um, our idea for that was, you know, like on the um, weather app, how you can scroll down and there's like an air quality Thing that's constantly updating that's like air quality in your area I think it's kind of like the same vision like it would be updating like that to see like the methane levels then you wanted to add something yeah and say in terms of specific location an initial challenge we all ran into was we wanted to work directly with the power plants to get their emissions but as we all know if somebody is polluting the air they're not going to want to tell you that they're polluting the air so we thought about um, what actually happens when pollution occurs which is smoke or um, gases come out of the power plant and into the community. So we realized technically anywhere in that surrounding area would be effective at collecting emissions. Yeah. Other questions, anyone? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so That's much. It? Okay. Thank you, guys. Hi, everyone. We did our project on Jahara Bell Consulting. I'm Abby Ward. I'm in grad school at UNC Wilmington studying integrated marketing communications. Um, my name is Johanna Batterton. I'm also a master's student at Northwestern University studying environmental engineering and science. My name is Olivia Griffith and I am at the University of South Florida studying environmental science and policy. I'm Shelby Deal. I am a junior at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington studying environmental science and creative writing. And I'm Erica Svendahl. Um, I go to Santa Clara University and I study chemistry and environmental science. So a little bit about our company. Jaharabel Consulting's mission is to help restaurant owners reduce their food waste in the state of California. Our company would be directly involved with the company Green Bites so we can connect with restaurants throughout the Golden State. We would achieve our outreach goals through different initiatives with partnerships and local contractors suited to meet the client's needs. And then just to touch on sustainable development goals really quick. Um, our project, like a lot of other ones here, hit on a lot of them, but I think the biggest one is going to be number 12 um, for responsible consumption and production. So some important statistics that really inspired this project are first that in the US, each person spends $2 a day on wasted food. 
and this ends up being approximately $680 billion in losses in developed countries or approximately $310 billion in losses in developing countries. Um, there's also greenhouse gas emissions associated with food waste. Uh, one pound of food waste equates to 0 0.078 pounds of methane, and food waste accounts for 7% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and also, there's 1.3 billion tons of food that gets wasted or lost throughout the world, um, which is equivalent to a third of all food produced. And a fourth of the food, a fourth of this food could feed 870 million hungry people. So this leads us to why we want to do this project. We want to reduce food waste, uh, reduce emissions associated with food waste, and make it easier for restaurants to help do their part while keeping their costs low still. And a company that we found very interesting and would be helpful to us is Green Bites. They're actually um, located here in Iceland. Um, what they do is they help reduce CO2 emissions by evaluating restaurants' menus, and they help connect restaurant owners with new chefs who are familiar with sustainable practices. Um, they also help restaurant owners with placing orders to the distributors, and they track the stocks of products to reduce food waste, and they order the proper quantities of food so they know how much they need and none of it goes to waste. Um, so what they would do with us is Green Bites would connect restaurants with our consulting firm um, for their distribution and product needs. And overall, this business relationship would reduce food waste and CO2 emissions, uh, promote and implement Johero Bell's consulting, uh, consulting sustainable farming and distribution techniques, and also educate restaurant owners and their workers on composting so they can grow their own fruits and vegetables. Yes, so in terms of finances for our consulting firm, um, from the consumer side, the restaurants being our consumers in this case, um, we want to try to make this as simple and efficient of a process possible because it's already hard for a lot of environmental startups to get the ground going, so we want to make it as easy as possible so people actually take part. So we're kind of going to have like a one-time cost for our customer, and that's going to be because of our partnership with contractors so that... A restaurant doesn't have to come to us, um, pay us for our research and time, and then also have a separate contract and payment with a, con with a contractor to construct the greenhouse. So because of our partnership with con local contractors, it can be like a one-time meets-all payment. Um, and this will vary depending on the restaurant's needs, which will gauge the, rest, uh, the greenhouse size and costs. And so based off some research, we are thinking we could probably get a two to the four dollar per square foot for greenhouse. So that will vary between um, each case scenario. And then for our personal costs in times of COVID, we thought let's go remote work, um, no rent for office space. Um, so we stay in a lot of contact with one another. But um, so then our main um, costs associated with Joy Bell would be from just paying our workers as well as the cost of creating these partnerships with local contractors. And then in terms of energy, um, overall we're going to, going to be discussing energy, soil, and water for our greenhouses. And so for energy, how we are going to be powering our greenhouses, um, one of the, our main focuses is we want to keep all this energy production predominantly on site. Because as we were learning from um, Iceland School of Energy, was that the further away this energy production is from the actual consumer, the more electricity you can lose along the way, which is less efficient energy, more money. And so to make it as costly and efficient as possible, um, we want to have like a baseline focus on geothermal energy being inspired here in Iceland. And in the state of California, there's a good amount of potential for this geothermal energy to be used. Um, to date, in 2020, geothermal already accounted for about 6% of the energy production in California. So there's a lot of potential there to then be uh, an already kind of a market created for it so it can be scaled up pretty readily. Um, also, in terms of the widespread use and potential, we are wanting to look more into like shallow well geothermal energy because rather than the deep ones that we are seeing here, for the idea of it being 
cheaper to not have as many permits associated with it. Um, less manual work of not going two kilometers into the ground. And um, also they, there's already, as I was kind of saying before, a market created for that. And it's easier to apply to an individual building rather than powering like an entire country. And we always want to have some backup energy. So depending on the location in the state, we'd be either using offshore wind, uh, solar, or hydroelectric for that backup energy. And in particular, if we're looking at one site in San Diego, we would definitely suggest for our restaurant to have that baseline geothermal, but do also be applying solar panels to the restaurant roof for backup energy. Next, we'll talk about soil. So we're gonna encourage restaurants to turn their spool into soil, which means you don't, <laughs> clever, isn't it? <laughs> which means using food scraps from the restaurant to turn into compost, which you can then use to grow more crops. We're gonna partner with local sustainable soil distributors. And this is mainly because some restaurants, I mean, we're trying to reduce their waste, so they might not have enough compost to turn into soil. So we would obtain additional soil needed if enough cannot be made in-house through different partners. We're also going to utilize insects like we saw at the tomato farm, where they use bumblebees to pollinate their tomato plants, and we'll do that to fertilize our crops. And then overall, making our soil in-house and also purchasing it from sustainably made partners, it would reduce methane emissions, reduce the need for chemical fertilizers, enhance water retention, provide carbon sequestration, provide higher yields, so more food with less soil, save on costs that would usually be spent on the soil, and overall just food being produced in a greenhouse allows you to control the environment no matter where you're located and no matter what your conditions are outside of the greenhouse. All right, so let's talk about water. Um, in California, 85% of the drinking water comes from groundwater, which in California happens to be pretty unsustainable because um, aquifers can't really refill um, quickly, like in a timely manner. Um, you can see on this graphic on the right here that <laughs> um, there has been significant decreases in the amount of groundwater available, particularly in the Central Valley. The Central Valley is the most agriculturally productive um, region in California and also one of the most agriculturally productive regions in the United States. Um, a lot of food <laughs> is grown there. And so specifically the San Joaquin Basin and the Tulare Basins um, are where most of that water is coming from. Um, you can see from 1960 to 2002, there has been a significant decrease um, in the amount of water available. Also, these blue sections on the graph here are wet years, while the white is dry. And you can just see how much like short dry span can like significantly um, decrease the amount of water available. So essentially, groundwater use is pretty unsustainable in California at the moment. Um, so as far as what our company will do is that we would want to consult with local water suppliers in order to learn about um, the local water resources for the restaurant and where the greenhouse would be in order to make it as sustainable as possible. Um, and in doing so, maybe we would want to chat about decentralized water um, and particularly um, in California, it would make a lot of sense to do rainwater capture. Um, something that happens along the west coast of the United States is that we get these things called atmospheric rivers, where essentially it just dumps a bunch of rain <laughs> for a couple of days. Um, and in the case of California, it might rain for a week in December, and then it won't rain again until next December. So it's really crucial that we collect that rainwater um, for recycling purposes. Um, yeah, so a big thing that we'd want to emphasize is just recycling rainwater, gray water, and black water for use in both the restaurant and the greenhouse. And then to summarize our services, the main thing that we're going to be doing is doing thorough personalized research for each one of our restaurants in order to um, see where the best location for the greenhouse would be along with the energy, soil, and water resources. Um, we want to <laughs> yeah, um, source local and sustainable meat and dairy products. Because our focus has been on um, greenhouses, we haven't done um, as much research into meat and dairy, but we also want to make sure that those are sourced sustainably, so we would help them partner with local farmers. Um, we also would help facilitate contractor partnerships. Um, we would also look into local grant um, assistance. Um, the Sustainable Water Boards in California, as well as the Department of Water Resources, always has a lot of grants going on. Um, they just want ideas. They're super ready and willing to fund all of them. 
yeah. <laughs> and so we would help them write those grants and that kind of thing as well. And then in the future, we would like to expand livestock and then also other states and eventually the world. <laughs> And of course, advertising is going to be a very important part of getting out Jahara Bell, what we do, and getting those partnerships. So of course, what's important is knowing our ideal audience and targets, that being business owners seeking to diminish their food waste and or are aiming to reduce their ecological footprint, but are encountering barriers preventing them from doing so. So some methods of approach we can use for advertising include referrals from our partner companies like Green Bites, um, doing business proposal emails, paid advertising, social media like Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and doing regular newsletters and emails as well. And here we have a sample business proposal cover. As you can see, we have Jahara Bell at the very top um, with a little slogan, reducing your company's eco footprint. We have a sample restaurant that we placed in Selfoss, um, which is here. Um, and then we just have company contact information at the bottom. And we hope that by um, incorporating photos um, such as this, where if the company you know, was real, we'd take our own photos and kind of have those and um, just really sell ourselves well and showing that we can be the ones to help um, make the change that restaurants need to see in the California area in that Golden State. So we really hope that by doing this with Jahara Bell that we can reduce food waste in California and hopefully eventually the world, as we've said. <laughs> so thank you for your time. running and you're in the stage that you want to be in and you're working with a local restaurant are you going to be trying to in terms of like how you would envision collecting the food waste would it be like you're coming into the restaurant at the end of the day or you're like having somebody as a consultant working in the restaurant at the same time to like collect all the food and monitor that it's actually being put in the right places because I feel like there's definitely a time component with the food waste so that it is actually able to be um, used in a proper way too. Um, so w would there be any kind of like post um, thing that you'd be doing of the food waste that would be happening still after you've been working with the company in terms of like collecting it for like fertilizers or anything like that? Okay. Since you work in a restaurant too. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean we, that's a very good point. Um, we did not explicitly talk about it uh, but I would, as, how I definitely interpret it is that we were more of a foundational research for them. And like that would be definitely like in terms of, especially with the soil aspect, like make closing that cycle, um, helping them set up the system. Because I know like set, making an in-house composting system, it's once you have the parts, it's not hard. If you, as long as you have those allocated responsibilities and pieces needed to do it, it is not that difficult. Um, so I, but I, so I don't see us like staying and like leaving a member of our team like associated with each restaurant. More making sure that they have the tools to set up those systems and um, function together. Yeah. Yeah. I have a much more specific question. What's Blackwater? Blackwater. Oh. <laughs> so, I okay. Blackwater, so gray water and black water, they're just different types of water that you use, and I'm pretty sure black water is stuff from like toilet waste and that kind of stuff. And so they're just different degrees of like how dirty they are. Or I think gray water is more something that would like go down your sink and like your kitchen or something like that. Yeah. So they take different degrees of like recycling and cleaning in order to use them again. Yeah. Yeah. I have a simple question. What is the story behind the name? Like why did you want that name? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we thought it'd be fun to come up with an actual name for the company, and we were just kind of sitting around like, huh, what do we do? And um, 
I just decided to piece together letters from each of our names. <laughs> and so in there, you'll find almost just kind of, if you, you could almost piece it in order of our names. Um, I know starting with Johanna, as a <laughs> Johero, um, and ending with Bell, which EL is mine. Um, and we're all just kind of pieced in there together. So yeah, Johero Bell. <laughs> Okay. Um, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Courtney. This is Demi, uh, Varun, and Abby. And today we're going to talk about the utilization of wastewater reclamation in a community housing project. Uh, so quickly to get started, we just want to talk about the global goals for sustainable development. The ones we're uh, pulling together are the clean water and sanitation, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, as well as responsible consumption and production. So what exactly are we doing? It goes into three main focuses. First and foremost, we're focusing on the reuse of wastewater. Um, so that's black and gray water, which we'll get into later. Sarah, we can answer your questions. Um, <laughs> secondly, we're retrofitting abandoned malls to use for affordable housing. And finally, we're using the reuse of wastewater and uh, the retrofitted malls to create hydroponic gardens. Essentially, what we're trying to do is uh, lessen the water usage in uh, public housing, making sure the water they use is sustainable and usable by the general public, and overall decreasing costs in, for every person that's going to use it. Uh, so yeah, so what are the types of wastewater? So as the last group said, there's two types, gray and black water. Um, Erica did say it so eloquently. Um, you have gray water, which is mostly sink, showers, bath, and laundry. That's mostly the non-toxic, uh, non-chemicals, um, water and then black water is the one from toilets, uh, so that's where your feces and urine would mix together. So the gray water we were thinking would be used, would be cleaned and reused for activities such as flushing the toilets, and then the black water could be cleaned and reused and put into the hydroponic garden, while the urine and fertilizer could be, while the urine and feces could be used again as fertilizer. So for the abandoned malls itself, there's a lot of specific reasons why it works out. Specifically, the, the malls right now are not being used. It's just a waste of land space and more of the allure of it is that people would attend it because it is an abandoned mall, but other than that, it has no use. Um, because these lands are already there, to create new areas, we wouldn't need to create more concrete. Concrete, as you might know, um, gives off a lot of carbon dioxide, so it solves two issues. It puts the low-income community into affordable housing and it develops models for sustainable communities for the future and beyond. Okay, and so the hydroponic garden system, the main focus of it was to utilize the excess black and gray water from the uh, treatment process we're installing. It'll pro provide sustainable food growth for the community that's living in the home. And additionally, gardening is proven to support improvement in mental health. So as you may or may not know, a lot of the unhoused community struggles with mental health issues. And so by implementing this hydroponic garden, they'll be able to spend their time gardening and improving their mental and both physical health as well. All right, so moving on to the why we decided to develop this. First, starting with why we chose to really focus on malls instead of creating separate communities is because there are over 300 malls that are currently or at risk of closure within the United States alone. And this is a huge deal because obviously malls take up a huge amount of land, they take up a huge amount of space, and they use a lot of resources. So for these over 300 to just be sitting abandoned is a lot of land and resources going to waste. And for our project specifically, since I'm a Cincinnati native, we chose to focus on Forest Fair Mall, which is actually very close to where I live. It is what was once the second largest mall in Ohio. It's a massive space, but it is currently 95% empty and has like one or two shops actually operating. Yet the Ramal remains open with 250 store slots um, and 1.5 million square feet of space. And the most it's being used for currently is Amazon car parking lots. And I personally believe that all of this space, as you can see in these pictures, could very much be repurposed and reutilized and used for things such as affordable housing. So when talking about the population specifically within Cincinnati area, 
Um, there's roughly 7,000 people who are considered to be unhoused or that come from like low income areas that would need this affordable housing resources. And this is a 12.5% increase um, from 2019. So it is on the rise. And especially with the pandemic that has recently occurred, these numbers are only continuing to grow. And unfortunately, in the 11 shelters we do have in Cincinnati, over a quarter of them are children. And so it's important to us and in environmental um, injustice and working towards being more socially put together that we get these kids educated and into better areas. Okay, so that's all good and well, but how are we actually gonna go about doing this, right? So gray water, right? Uh, as Erica put it, it's just non-toxic, regular sink, dishwasher, laundry, et cetera. Um, so retrofitting malls, basically, we're just, we're just it, it means we can fully install new piping so we can separate the gray water and we can separate the black water, treat them both differently. Uh, the gray water, um, you do, there are some caveats to it. You can't just straight up put it right into the gardening soil, but uh, you have to use low sodium and low phosphate soap, detergent, et cetera. Um, and then you can direct it directly into the soil so the plants can use it. Uh, you just don't want it to get on the edible parts of the plant because you know there's a variety of just issues and you know it's kind of yuck. Um, it can be used to flush toilets and also in um, just laundry, just reuse like that. Black water. Okay, this is a whole different beast, right? Um, it can be, so it's black water, as we know, it's got the gross stuff in it. Um, it can be transferred into a sludge holding tank or a clarifier to settle out the solids. Um, the clarified liquid, that I'll go further into detail, but basically it'll be transferred into, uh, just with the gray water into the soil, uh, the settled sludge. It can stay for a month to kill pathogens, and then, uh, as Abby put it, we turn the spoil into soil. Um, with the black, with the clarified liquid, we'd add coagulants to the liquid um, prior to clarification, just so that, you know, solids coagulate, they settle out, and then the clarified liquid is even cleaner than if we didn't use coagulants. Um, currently, aluminum sulfate is the most common coagulant. Um, you know, it's obviously it's sulfate. People get worried, like, oh, if it goes in water, will you make sulfuric acid? Like, yes but nobody's sticking their hand into like a bucket of black water, so please don't do that. Um, the settling time for particles, clearly it depends on particle size. Uh, it can range from seconds to hours, years. Um, typically the, the, the ones that take years are obviously a lot smaller, but these are things that plants can use um, as forms of nutrition. So we will be focusing on just like about a two hour settling time to get those things on the bottom um, and then everything else can be used. Uh, cost breakdown, right. So the renovation of the pre-existing pipes, obviously, um, in terms of construction stuff, it'll be a little more than this, but just for the gray water pipe system right now, it'll, it'll range from about $800 to $4,000. Um, in terms of construction, renovating the mall uh, into living areas, that'll be anywhere from $40,000 to $200,000, um, regarding how much, uh, depending on how much is being changed. A new wastewater treatment system is essentially just coagulant chemicals and a clarifying tank, which is about... $1,500, uh, and then the hydroponic system, which is actually pretty cheap. It's about $300 to $1,000. Um, so when we were developing this project, we thought there's a few uh, challenges that could be faced, and so this was the main challenge we think will be improving the public perception. So for example, uh, use of wastewater for crops. A lot of people currently are very uncomfortable with the idea of using, um, you know, consuming crops that are from I guess, new, built or grown from their own waste. Um, and so what we think that we can do is educating them on actually what fertilizer is as a whole, and then hopefully they'll be able to be better um, or be more ready to, to consume that food. And the second thing is affordable housing community being so close to the people of Fairfield. Uh, historically, there have been issues with affordable housing and people's perception of those types of people that are in those housing. And people are generally a little bit uncomfortable with that. So our thought is potentially providing uh, community events where both the residents of our uh, community housing as well as residents within the community of Fairfield can come and they can kind of meet each other face to face and then you have a bit more of a personal connection with these people instead of just seeing them as some kind of statistic. Okay, so looking into more specific organizations within Cincinnati that we believe we could kind of get on board with us since 
like said earlier, getting grants from the government and other funding such as that is wishy-washy and unpredictable. So we would rely heavily upon the nonprofit organizations in the area. Um, the two that I wanted to focus on specifically were for the humanities, Matthew 25 Ministries. They do an excellent job of providing for those who have been in disastrous situations and um, as well as environmental groups such as Green Umbrella who are awesome for getting the community involved with environmental sustainability. Okay, so just we're just going to run through this really quickly. I'm sure you guys can uh, read this, um, but the key key resources we'd need um, is just you know clearly an abandoned mall. Um, we need contractors to complete the work, uh, a hydroponic system, and then just a gray water recycling system. Those are the bare bones of that. Yeah, I mean we specific we went through a lot of it, but specifically for segments and value propositions. So our beneficiaries would be the unhoused population and the, and the underserved communities. And our customers, customers so to speak, would be the government and just communities around them all, so Fairfield in this case. Uh, so the value propositions for the beneficiaries will be developing jobs by allowing these underserved and unhoused population to help build these malls if they should, if they should so choose to do so. Um, and also we'd be providing emotional support through gardening and giving educational initiatives on what the building itself is doing and the science behind it so they can look for jobs in, the similar, in a similar set of fields. Um, for customers, so for the government and the communities, we'd be repurs repurposing wasted opportunities for land, and also we'd be developing a model for other buildings to follow um, for reused wastewater on the residential scales should other communities try to adopt it as well. And our impact measures, of course, less of the unhoused population would be on the streets and in actual good housing and there's an increased education about sustainability in the process of it all. Um, and then in terms of the cost structure, so we did speak about the cost structure as a whole, but we did not speak about surplus or revenue. So we're thinking that the main revenue will come in will be from humanitarian groups. Uh, that will be about 60% we're uh, assuming. We can also generate additional revenue through renting out garden plots, and that could be another way that we could get more um, of a community aspect with the other people of Fairfield that are not living in our uh, community housing. That we're expecting about 20%. And the other 20% would come from potentially renting um, some of the houses that we're retrofitting for other people other, or other demographics other than specifically just the unhoused. And that's all we have. That so, it. yeah. <laughs> Questions? Jake? Uh, I know you talked about revenue, but uh, in terms of, since it's such like a big scale project, um, what about uh, initial revenue to start off with since you need to do so much work at the beginning? Um, that is one of our biggest setbacks is getting the um, upfront funds for it, but that's kind of where these nonprofit organizations and hopefully government grants would kind of come into play. It would take some like campaigning obviously for it and getting the word around. Um, so that's where we were kind of relying on it, but as you said, it is large cost. So that's kind of up in the air for now. Yeah, and I can add a little bit more. I mean, I think also it is a long-term process, so we could start with educational initiatives more than anything. Um, like we could have us, we could have other people who are more, well, knowledgeable about this, I'd say, like people who have worked on some of these systems their whole life. We can have them give talks, give seminars, start off slowly and then develop like a, a foundation where people are like more excited to do this and by that time I'm assuming we'd have a group and then work from there. Expensive, yeah. yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think that would be a big thing would be to get the community involved um, because all these malls, they're, they're basically for the community. You start advertising this as something that could help them, as something that, well, it is for the unhoused population. If the community gets behind it, I feel like that big push is there. And then, obviously, if we're doing all the educational initiatives on the side, that biggest thing is that first push. Um, but just fundraising and all that stuff around it and getting the backing um, would be able to help tell the government, like, hey, this is something we're doing. Whoever's owning these abandoned malls, I think it was uh, some mills, some, some something, some company. But um, <laughs> if, if it's like, 
if there's enough backing behind it, I think that would be enough to sway certain people to get bigger companies involved to try to buy off them all. Yeah, for sure. That's that's a big question we have. Obviously, you know, we'd like to get the uh, government involved, um, but we don't want to have the government pay out the entire cost of a mall. So we were thinking maybe like, like there is, um, where was it? Like Courtney said, we can we can definitely rent. I don't know if you want to go into detail about that, mm -hmm. but you know, renting would be a would be an option. But um, right now, yeah, that's like getting the access to the uh, the mall itself is one of the biggest uh, setbacks, like Demi said. But to add on to what Jessica, you were going to say is um, actually just like a, an anecdote from my own life is uh, there was a, an abandoned mall maybe like 20 minutes from my house and nobody liked it. That thing was so ugly. And <laughs> like people, people just got like really riled up about it because they were going to just, they weren't going to touch it. They were going to like abandon the land, stuff like that. And then people were like, no, just, you know, renovate them all. Just make it look pretty again. Make people want to go there. And they were like bumper stickers and like refrigerator magnets being passed around. It was crazy. And then eventually people started going into like talking to the, um, like the supervisor of the town or whoever. And eventually like work did get done on that mall and it's, it's gorgeous now. It's beautiful if you ever want to if you're ever in Long Island, but um, yeah, I mean, so it's like, uh, it was like the, the, that quote from the first presentation, like you don't realize how much like a little community of people can do. Um, so yes, obviously, yes, obtaining access to the mall would be a little bit tough, but don't underestimate what, just a small community, the power of a common person, yeah. educational slash, um, I don't want to say re-entry because I know they're not like all formerly incarcerated, but just some kind of re-entry program that kind of gets them back on their feet to tackle the systemic homelessness, or is there going to be any kind of education in terms of financial literacy and things like that to help them get back up? Yeah, so absolutely. I think a lot of the part, we didn't want to go too into it in our presentation, but a lot of the purpose of having such a big space and using this as a community and getting those specific organizations involved is to kind of help with the reintegration for those who were struggling with that, kind of get people on their feet, help, because a lot of the issues, especially in the shelters as well, is it's unsafe. And even with these resources for help, they are unable to actually get their real footing. So it would definitely play more into the environmental justice aspect of it of we can't have we can't have the sustainability if we're not including everyone. So really making sure everybody is really included in it is kind of our main goal, getting everybody educated and everything. Good question. Yes, Jake. Awesome presentation. <laughs> I love the questions. I have some questions later. But we've hit our time for your group, so uh, round of applause for them. <laughs> okay, we've struck platooning. Woo, yeah. Let's I go. am ready to hear it, and I'm excited for it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, okay, so today, uh, Susanna, Tyler, and myself will be talking about our capstone project. Our project is basically... Um, uh, an implement, uh, implementation of a truck platoon program, which will be a communicative program where they will essentially be able to um, connect with each other to um, tackle uh, environmental issues. Yeah, so the two main points we're trying to address here are um, our improvement to the log logistics systems for transport of goods over long distances, and secondly, the climate crisis by basically reducing energy consumption of the vehicles that are taking part in the logistics. Yeah. Did it move? All right. Yeah, what she just said is our problem. Semi trucks <laughs> <laughs> take up large amounts of space on roads, sometimes multiple lanes, and they are. Because they're the largest vehicles, they use up the most fuel. So we think trucks traveling closer together will use less fuel and road space than those normally driving farther apart. So if we could create technology that forces trucks to brake and accelerate at the same rate, they would able, be able to travel 
closer together in larger groups, hence truck platooning. Okay, so why are we doing this? Um, our main, I guess one of the main uh, issues that we identified was that uh, fuel efficiency with, with trucks are obviously very bad. So, um, sorry, we'll kind of go in between the imperial system and the metric system here, but uh, so uh, we, we saw from research that uh, a space of between three to 10 meters uh, equates to, um, I guess, with a, a, a more aerodynamic system of putting these trucks closer together equates to a uh, fuel saving of eight to 11%, which is quite significant. Um, and this is calculated at 80, 90 kilometers per hour. Um, this would also, we kind of thought that this would additionally reduce traffic for all road users. If you have a system that uh, combines all these trucks versus you know, various trucks that are you know, driving around, I know it's kind of annoying to get around trucks. Uh, if they're all in one system, we kind of extrapolated that this would be a lot easier to get around. Uh, this also, we thought, would improve driver welfare um, with a system that kind of calculates all these things, especially with these drivers that are making these very long trips. It, it will make uh, their jobs a lot easier and therefore improve uh, road user safety. And then we kind of identified global goals that this kind of pertains to, um, namely number seven, affordable and clean energy. Number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. 11, sustainable cities and communities. 12, responsible consumption and production. This kind of goes along with the transportation of goods. And then obviously 13, climate action. I would just add with the fuel efficiency, if you're thinking uh, that trucks might just go electric, um, actually if we want to continue to live the luxurious lives that we do in the future we still have to reduce the actual energy that they use even if that energy is coming from a sustainable source so even if they go electric still relevant okay so we investigated four different ways of connecting the uh, trucks together um, the most intuitive ones are probably the physical connections um, so at first you might think okay you can just hook the two you can just hook the trucks together by some kind of literally a physical hook. Um, and maybe if you're thinking a little bit more broadly, um, we can go onto a magnet, which can be easily switched on and off so that we can c connect and disconnect um, via an automatic system. Uh, but both of these uh, systems have kind of uh, problems in that physical bar in between the trucks. doesn't allow anybody to go between, so that might be a motorcyclist or just a small car um, or even a pedestrian because, you know, you never know. Um, even though this is meant for highways, there are always emergencies, there might be something in the middle of the road, whatever. Um, and also, it's the disconnection and connection is, is difficult. Um, and they can't... If you're using a physical connector, you can't, um, you can't change the distance between the trucks very easily. You know, you're fixed at this distance that you've set the, you know, this bar to or the size of the hook. So basically, we're going to go on to a contactless connection system. We thought about two ideas. First of all, GPS, which uses a satellite tracking system, um, which, um, as you probably know from Google Maps on your phone, puts you in a place on a road. But it's not always very accurate, as you probably all know. Um, the, the tolerance is about a few metres, which is not accurate enough for our purposes. And also, um, it might not work if you go into a tunnel, go under a bridge, even a tree they're all um, issues in the way. So we basically are going to settle on Bluetooth as the connection system. We know that it's wireless. We can easily connect and disconnect. It's accurate. Um, and we don't have the barriers. Uh, it doesn't care whether there's a, um, a tunnel or anything in the way because we're just going truck to truck rather than to a satellite and back. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're concluding that Bluetooth is the way to go. Um, if you're going to research this project further, actually implement it, the key points that we'd have to go into is obviously a big new software system. Um, we need to investigate whether trucks that exist on the roads already have Bluetooth enabled already. I've never driven a lorry, 
these guys haven't either. Um, obviously, a lot of modern cars do have all this Bluetooth stuff already, but actually, a lot of trucks that are on the roads, especially in Europe, I don't know about the US, are still pretty old school with what they've got in front of them. So if they don't actually already have this technology, we might need an extra system that needs to be connected. We need to work out how that's going to work. Um, we need to educate the general public on what a platoon is, how to get around it, and we need to educate the drivers themselves, which might be via financial incentives to driving companies or advertisements to a driver's union. So, for example, I think the URTU is one in the UK with about 14,000 members. Um, and then emergency procedures. So if there is an issue, uh, what do we do to exit the pl platoon, um, stop it, disconnect it? Yeah. And then just a separate point about radar. Um, so we've talked about the Bluetooth, which is the way that um, the trucks are going to connect to tell each other, I am braking now, you need to brake to, or I'm accelerating, you need to accelerate to. But radar is a separate system that we need to be used for each truck to identify how far away it is from the one that's in front. So it needs to see, so say it's set via some kind of system that has seen the weather and the stopping distance, etc. Um, that it's a certain distance away. So you know, it's set, I need to be 30 metres away at all times. The radar is what, you know, uh, regulates that. Yeah. Um, just a bit of math to prove the point. Um, so this is a system without um, platooning. So you've got to uh, drive far enough away from the guy in front so that um, you can perceive the, um, in an emergency, you can perceive, perceive the thing that's gone wrong. Then you can react, i.e. push your foot on the brake, and then you've got a braking distance. If we eliminate the perception reaction time, which we've researched is 1.5 seconds, uh, then we can uh, basically uh, reduce that distance quite significantly. So we've only got the time it takes for the Bluetooth to connect, which we're taking is about zero. So if we assume the truck's traveling at 90 kilometers per hour, which is 25 meters per second, uh, the perception reaction distance, i.e. speed times time, is 37 and a half meters. Um, we've said this Bluetooth distance is about zero and uh, the braking distance is about 80 metres. So we've reduced the um, stopping distance from 117.5 metres to 80 metres. All right, here's our business model. So our key partners would be vehicle manufacturers, software companies, and truck transportation companies. And activities we would do together would be driver training, um, an overarching system of truck companies working together to get this technology made, and then public discussions. Our resources would include cash, new truck technology, and possibly researching autonomous driving. Our two main propositions are increasing fuel efficiency, therefore decreasing carbon emissions by having trucks drive closer together in groups and then the reduction of trucks causing traffic in multiple lanes because they're now in one lane. Our customer relationships would be, we, we would do it by showing the customers how much they will save on fuel, and then we're working together with green groups because they would probably like to reduce carbon emissions. To do channels, we would have regular conferences for the first few years to get fire, uh, feedback from drivers in the community, and we'd have regular updates and improvements to the platooning system. Our, and then these customers would include major retail companies, transport companies, environmental agencies, national and state governments, and then drivers unions. Our uh, costs we put into two sections, so fixed and variable. So fixed costs would be however much it costs to fit the truck with the GPS and short-range short communication technology, and then the initial public education and advertising. And our variable costs would be the training, which could go up as the project is scaled up, because more and more drivers, drivers will need this training. And then the incentives for drivers to train may end up costing a lot more money. And the technological advancement for the research will, incre will require increased funding. But our profit, we would get it from these major transport companies and government bodies who choose to buy into the new technology. And these companies may sponsor their own drivers to take part in our training. And we can 
use this revenue to make more advertisements on other people's trucks and trailers. And we can also reinvest into further research and data collection to assess how successful our scheme is. All right, so with all of that said and done, obviously we do have some issues with um, our project. Uh, with the um, looking at you know, a road map, you'll obviously have areas where there are single lane highways. Um, and as we all um, can probably attest to, it's really annoying to have to get around trucks. Um, and so if we were to have a platoon of trucks, imagine getting around like eight trucks, which would be impossible. Um, that being said, we would probably disable this um, platoon feature for single um, lane highways so that this would not be an issue anymore. Uh, this would definitely <laughs> worsen accidents if uh, in the case that something were to happen with the addition of multiple uh, semis uh, being banded together, that's just that much more inertia. Um, a lot more energy is put into a car accident, which could be very bad. Um, this could also uh, introduce unforeseen traffic issues. We wouldn't really be able to tell you until this is actually put into test in the real world. Um, same with uh, or variability in weather. Um, things like uh, rain would obviously affect the calculation of braking. Yeah, sorry, they'd have to travel further apart in yes. conditions yeah. and all. And then, um, obviously, if in the case that there were system failure where our technology were to, um, you know, there would be a disconnection or something like that, uh, this could obviously result in an accident if not all of the drivers are completely aware of it, actually. Okay, so uh, that being said, so we're going to move on to what could be next with our project, what we see for the future of this. Um, we could certainly implement this technology into autonomous vehicles. O autonomous vehicles are becoming obviously more and more popular um, with more research done on them. And uh, incorporating that with smart electric vehicles, um, that would be able to uh, integrate that braking system into the car versus a uh, physical um, arm that were to be uh, accelerating or decelerating. Um, we also thought of the uh, possibility of a modular car that would physically attach to itself um, at, uh, much like a train would, and then um, that would just help with calculations of momentum. And then uh, furthering that, it would be developing an app where all compat uh, compatible vehicles would be able to uh, locate all of the uh, you know, trucks uh, that you'd be able to join uh, in a platoon. And then you'd be able to, within that app, just customize, um, you know, uh, user input with brake, weight of your car, truck length, weather, et cetera. So that would further optimize. So uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. And uh, <laughs> open the floor for questions. Uh, I just want to say before we start the questions here, from where this group was when we all had that group share of ideas, <laughs> from all the questions that you received, Suzanne, <laughs> to where you are now with this project and answering all of those questions and having this fully developed and you had the math in there and everything, I'm proud of you and congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think, oh yeah. I think we have Joanna. Yeah, awesome guys. Um, one thing, so we're talking about especially like how single lane highways would be a problem, but like in like two plus lane um, highway systems, were you all thinking that um, it would be, there's like a designated, and wherever you make agreements with, I guess it would be like, whoever's in charge of highways, um, like that, like this, like left, 
most or rightmost lane is like a designated lane for this or is it like a wherever one starts and they start connecting just like that's the lane they're in or is this or you think um, designation i would say they're always going to travel they would always travel in the slowest lane but it's not going to be full of trucks um usually when you're driving on the motorway there's not trucks everywhere um, you know, if you see a truck normally every 30 seconds, those eight trucks that you saw over a four-minute period would all be squashed into one thing, and the rest of the four minutes you basically won't see any trucks because they're all together. So you hope that the slow lane will still be able to be used by normal drivers. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the Bluetooth connection, that would just be like, I'm assuming like a module on the dashboard of the car, mm -hmm. or sorry, truck. Uh, would that be like dangerous to operate? I'm assuming it would just be like press a button to connect, press a button to disconnect. And how would you install that software or hardware into the truck? Um, well, we didn't necessarily talk about that within our group, but we, I mean, yes, this would be something that you could essentially, you know, be on your app, find your local platoon, kind of time it. I mean, obviously you can see on the motorway, you, you can see, you know, where trucks are, if they're especially combined. Um, and then with like proximity, you'd be able to connect via Bluetooth. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, there's um, the suction cup, you know, things on, on your car where you put your phone up there. So it could be a modular system just like that. Yeah. Okay, you don't, you don't think that operating a gigantic vehicle while also trying to connect to a, a truck? Um. I'd add potentially um, if this get, gets you know far enough and we get enough funding from government bodies and stuff, I'd say at each entry and exit to the motorway, mm -hmm. you basically would have a, some kind of bridge or a little sensor that the um, mm -hmm. truck goes underneath and it sees that and there's some system that says you're at junction 43 and there's a platoon 50 metres ahead of you yeah. so that it goes on and already knows. Oh, okay. I see. All right. That's smart. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so, you guys mentioned a lot about education, so you could already have this in there. So you mentioned about like talking about emergency procedures, how to operate the system and all that stuff. Um, have you thought about um, how to deal with like community backlash? Because unfortunately for your first <laughs> your first like presentation, you guys had a lot of questions that were um, concerned about the safety. And I'm not, I believe this is a safe system, but even with electric cars, people were like, well, that's dangerous. I need to be in control of my car. And, like, similar things. Are you going to like kind of piggyback off of that movement? So like moving towards electric cars and moving towards like um, things that aren't automated or controlled by humans or or did you have a plan? If not, it's okay because again, that's pretty deep. So. <laughs> so, um, so when it comes to autonomous driving, I don't think we're there yet. So we would start off with the real drivers with yeah. mixed <laughs> with the autonomous stuff. But then um, like to get people on board, you have to show them what, like, how it works. Make YouTube videos. Make, um, make it part of the driving test that you have to take. Yeah. Um, so just like overall educate about the system, show that it does work, and then mm -hmm. people will be more. You know, unfortunately, with all of the um, data, the statistics, all everything that we have collected with autonomous vehicles and how actually more safe they are theoretically, um, yes, you'll obviously have some backlash and it'll honestly just come to a point where um, it's, you know, you, you for how many hours, you like, you, we can just put, you know, statistics of like, you know, this is safe or not, but. Um. <laughs> I honestly think this is the sort of thing that you'd be discussing much more with the drivers' unions and the actual truck drivers than you would with the general public. I know we yeah. did say to education the general public, but the general public won't be seeing this all the time. I mean, most of the time, time I drive a car, I'm not actually on a highway. Um, and if I am and I see a few trucks, I wouldn't necessarily notice they're part of a platoon. It just looks like eight trucks in a row and then you just carry on with your life. So I think, <laughs> I don't know, I don't talk to truck drivers that often. So I don't know, I mean, maybe, it's just, maybe it's just my perception. I'm not sure as a normal road user you would even notice it that much. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's wrong. Like you say, it's something that you have to kind of see what happens and then react to. Yeah, and I'm not saying it's going like, to be something that's a huge issue. I'm just curious. Cause, I mean, with anything, you get backlash. So like, you can't only count on your negative opinions. Yeah. This isn't really a question, it's, it's more of a my take on your question. 
is exactly what you just said. It's not so much selling it to the public. I think the, the way the trucking industry works, the dispatchers and the companies that are responsible for the drivers and the actual transport of the goods are actually going to be really receptive to something like this because how you first pitched it, it's increased fuel efficiency. They get there safer, faster, less fuel being spent. It's mm -hmm. more money in everybody's pocket. Yeah. And it's a technology that I think they would be far readier to integrate, especially through some of the add-ons you just gave, like how they, how those sensors are, could really already be integrated into like the, scale, the weight scaling systems and everything that they are already passing through. I think, I think the trucking industry would be very receptive to an idea like this. Well, good point, Tim. There's so, I don't know, there's so many things that are there, like even the things you notice in your car, a lot of the things you may see as add-ons are part of regulations that are required and are to come. Yeah. And this is a great thing if you all want to read a great infrastructure bill for the U.S. about yeah. things. Uh, exactly. There's millions of dollars for it there. Exactly. Uh, on that note, one round of applause again for the first Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin, this is Sam, and Melissa, and Marley, and we're going to be presenting our d idea called Southeast Wind, which is providing wind energy solutions uh, specifically for New Hanover County in North Carolina. So first, just to go over the problem, the bigger problem that we are seeking to address is the fact that the southeastern U.S. has not taken advantage of its full wind energy potential. Um, they've fallen behind other regions of the U.S. in terms of transitioning to clean and renewable energy. Um, besides the fact that a transition to clean energy will reduce the negative impacts of climate change, a transition to renewable energy will create a more sustainable infrastructure that future generations can also rely on. There are some barriers to implementing wind energy, such as dealing with the inevitable hurricanes that exist in the southeast region, uh, but wind turbines can now withstand uh, category four hurricane wind speeds and um, continue to grow in power capacity as well. A few years ago, the average onshore wind turbine was rated at two and a half to three megawatts, and that could produce an um, um, more than 6 million kilowatt hours every year. So for perspective, if just two wind turbines were built on each of the 59 farms that exist in New Hanover County that could produce, say, now in 2021, now that they have more power capacity, uh, 10 million kilowatt hours every year, this has the potential to produce a total of over 1 billion kilowatt hours annually, or roughly the equivalent amount of energy required to power the 114,830 homes, 839 homes, in <laughs> New Hanover County. Um, so the technology is there. The bigger obstacle to overcome is the bad perceptions of wind energy that exist. So for instance, the Council of New Hanover County recently unanimously voted that offshore wind turbines would need to be at least 24 nautical miles off the coast and also held that none were built, uh, that none should be built that are visible from the town. So just to talk about our what, how, and why, um, to combat this issue, we propose a nonprofit that provides wind energy info to farmers and connects, connects them to power companies for wind turbine installation. The way we will be doing this work is through community outreach at local events like farm, farmers markets where we can interact with farmers face to face in a public setting as opposed to you know, going to their property and um, you know, doing solicitation which is probably not the best method. Um, in order to form partnerships with power companies, we will reach out to them under the premise that we'd be helping them meet the uh, state's regulations for uh, generating renewable energy. Uh, for example, North Carolina House Bill 951 mandates 70% decarbonization by the next decade, um, and we would be finding them new places to build power generation where the people that they would have to be getting the permission from are already open to that idea. Um, so we're trying to, you know, be the bridge. 
Um, we specifically wanted to start our organization's work in New Hanover County, North Carolina, because our group has personal ties to the area, and so we're familiar with local events and the entities that we would need to be interfacing with. Uh, we see this as our small effort that is a part of the bigger effort to bring wind energy to the south as part of the transition to clean and renewable energy from traditional generation from coal. If we convince farmers that wind energy can be really beneficial, this will create a constituency that will spread this better perception of wind energy and will sort of enable that path forward. So um, an example of a conversation we might um, have with farmers when we're pitching our idea to them, um, we would um, first pr propose how wind turbines would directly benefit the farmer. So this would be um, financial benefits, such as they would um, get uh, tax credits and earn up to $8,000 per year um, per turbine. Um, so we would talk about the financial benefits for them. Um, this would also provide um, electricity for the farmers themselves, so they would save money on that. Um, and we would also emphasize, um, emphasize selling passive income, so minimum labor to make profits, or in their case, really not that much labor. As soon as the turbines go up, they wouldn't have to do any work. Um, and then after that, if the farmer is interested, um, we would contact Duke, Duke Energy. So again, minimal effort for the farmer. Um, so for a farmer, this almost seems too good to be true. So they would probably have a lot of questions and concerns. Um, one question could be, can these turbines withstand strong coastal storm winds? And we've already touched on that a little bit, but the answer to that is yes. So we um, were researching some new technology that can, um, of wind turbines that can withstand um, winds up to 178 miles per hour. And as a reference, Category 5 hurricanes um, can have winds up to 156 miles an hour. Um, also, these um, turbines will be placed inland, so it, will have, um, it won't be exposed to the strongest um, winds, as opposed to if we put them offshore. Um, and from an environmental standpoint, um, a question could be, don't wind turbines affect bird, po bird populations? Yes, but compared to our domesticated cat species, our pet cats or the feral cats um, that kill billions of bird birds every year, um, this is such a tiny fraction. So it really would not have that much effect on the bird population. The, south, the southeast is prone to higher winds due to tropical storms that occur in the area. So farmers ha that have land in the south in southeast, southeastern U.S. have a great opportunity for wind turbines to be placed to get the ma maximum benefit from the turbines. Some of the resources that we will have is people, finance, and access. We will also need to have a website in order to advertise the service, assi service of assisting local people to understand benefits of wind energy and provide step-by-step -step instructions for applying, gr for applying to grants and receiving tax benefits. When we start up our nonprofit, we will have a small initial payment to secure the services that we will need to use. The types of programs that our nonprofit will be carrying out is community outreach at farmers markets, informing farmers of the benefits of wind energy, educating farmers on the misconceptions <coughs> associated with wind energy, such as the common mis misconception that turbines cannot withstand hurricane winds, wind speeds up to 178 miles per hour. Spain has new technology that was awarded a typhoon resistant type certificate. This shows that there is technology that can produce turbines that can withstand high speed tropical storm winds. We will be providing a service by first educating the farmers that may be interested in having wind turbines installed on their farm and then connecting them to the companies who will then build and install the wind turbines on their farm. By doing this, we are trying to expand the usage of wind energy in the area of New Hanover County to create a cleaner environment. <coughs> in order to reach these farmers, we will attend events such as the Wrightsville Beach and Riverfront Farmers Markets, 
council and town hall meetings, different community outreach events, and collaborations with Dakota House and different community farms. The farmers market at Riceville Beach and the riverfront are good ways that we can connect and educate people of many different backgrounds who may know a lot about renewable energy, or those who may not know a lot, a lot about renewable energy. Council and town hall meetings are a good way to get a change to the regulations that are in place for the environment. And Dakota House is a great location to hold a community that is interested in learning about wind turbines and what renewable energy can do for the environment. Community farms are also a great way to reach out to the people who are interested in the environment but may not know much about renewable energy. So holding an event there will allow people to learn more about the importance of renewable energy, specifically wind energy. So our um, partners in key stakeholders, um, our company would contact Duke Energy, who would um, use a company like General Electric to actually create and install the turbines. Um, EERE would help fund the project. And of course, we would need um, help and funds um, from local farms and landowners around the southeastern United States to make this happen. So who benefits from our particular service? The farmers, um, our customers. So who pays for the particular service? Our um, wind-powered energy is going to be the federal, federal gov government and anyone who pays for power in New Hanover County. In terms of value proposition, um, so our hope is that um, our nonprofit isn't just valuable for farmers. Um, we would like to um, uh, have contracts with construction and engineering companies. Um, the power companies would benefit by um, diversifying their energy profile, meeting state clean energy regulations, and increasing the amount of power that they generate. Um, General Electric would have more customers um, buying their products. And the impact measures, um, what we will be able um, to measure how much of the impact our nonprofit is making by looking at factors such as number of wind turbines we can help install, number of people that install wind turbines, how much power we help install, and how much money is saved on people's power bills. And um, the income that farmers will receive for putting up turbines on their land and um, more sustainable power in the grid and the coastal storm vulner vulnerable areas are um, our customer value proposition. So our initiative cost structures would be mostly a website domain, which would roughly be about $2 a month, and also a professional email so that uh, farmers and others can contact us for our services. We would also need a cost of paying employees a stipend for the training and knowing how to uh, communicate what we will be helping with and performing the operations of applying for grants. And we will also provide resources um, such as transportation, so like funding, uh, volunteer activities such as setting up at the farmers markets and having pamphlets and flyers and signs. Our revenue would be coming from individual donations majorly, but also corporate giving such as cause-related marketing so companies can feel better that they're helping the farm, so say restaurants and grocery stores and other businesses, um, and small fees and government grants. Our surplus, we, since we're a nonprofit, we'll have restricted funds that would just be used for furthering and reinvesting in these renewable <coughs> energy initiatives and also taking um, any donations to further spread the idea and educate more people about the renewable energy and pay down any debts from loans. So our sustainable development goals that we'll be progressing are affordable and clean energy, industry innovation and infrastructure, and sustainable cities and communities. And by doing so, we'll have, uh, for New Hanover County, as the eighth worst pollution level, 
and most 99% of the energy they currently use comes from non-renewable sources. So uh, by implementing more durable and smarter wind technology will help uh, to reduce the cost from hurricane damage and also reducing generator use from, uh, which is mostly fueled by non-renewable fuel sources and is bad for people's health. So New Hanover County is one of the fastest growing regions and coastal regions in general have a higher population and especially during summer months with tourism, energy use goes up. So it is important to have that there. And uh, yeah, it will help build community resilience in these areas. So for current new, uh, offshore wind is focusing like in North Carolina, a lot is at Kitty Hawk. And this is another popular tourist destination. And the coastal regions are heavily affected by hurricane damage. So, but we also have a high wind resources there. Yeah. But it would be at the farms that are, we, our inshore uh, initiative would focus more on farms that are further away from the city centers and the downtown areas and the beaches. Okay. So it would not be in the view of tourism. So we wouldn't have that backlash. No, no, no. I, I'm asking why don't you like another county in general because they have less oh, well, regulation. Eventually, our goal is to spread it throughout um, the southeastern coast. But we, we just chose to focus in on New Hanover County because of those personal connections okay. um, for research. We, I mean, it was easier to choose, like, example to farmers markets. And, okay. Yeah. And of course, like, with anywhere in the <laughs> south. Uh, east, we're gonna come into barriers like this, where the politicians that there that are leading the communities there are representative of them, and so um, if we ch we can change the way that the people think there, then laws and regulations will follow from that. Okay. Can I can I add to that for them? <laughs> sure. uh, so New Hanover County, so. Uh, Marley mentioned Kitty Hawk, and that's where in North Carolina the only <coughs> offshore wind farm is. But New Hanover County is the second, or is is it's equally tied for wind energy. Like you do an analysis of wind energy energy along the entire East Coast, um, those two spots in North Carolina are <coughs> among the most suitable oh, and most efficient for wind energy. So that. Any other questions? What did you say again? It was the eighth um, largest Hindu uh, in, in North Carolina, okay. the, of, of counties in North Carolina. Got it, got it. I have a question. Would you be able to take me back to a slide? Yeah. I believe the second or third one, the one with the number. The one where I was doing calculations? Yes. 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 Like I, need a calculator. <laughs> I can't walk you through that. <laughs> it was this I would is it, is it that one or this one? Maybe, yeah, it, was, it, was it was somewhere was, on this slide. This is the one where I was doing math, if that's you, what you're referring yes, to. Yes, this one. <laughs> uh, you were talking through if you like put wind turbines on how many farms were there? So there's 59 farms in the county, and I was suggesting that if we, um, like as opposed to having large wind farms that would take up a lot of area and be what people would think of as an eyesore, you just have a, two wind turbines on each farm in the county, then that would have the potential to supply enough energy to supply all of the homes that exist in the county um, with the new wind turbine um, technology that we were researching. About. Okay. Uh, can you just talk, like, what were like the basic numbers that you're using there? So you said 59 farms, yes. two wind turbines per farm. And, and then so what turbo like what was our yeah the amount of energy that each turbine would be producing uh, annually is around 10 million kilowatt hours um, so multiplying that by 259 um, would get you up to 
like just over a billion kilowatt hours per year. What size turbines are we talking about? Like um, I'm sitting here thinking a hundred capacity turbines in New Hanover County. That's so uh, that's they're yeah things. they're quite tall. They're, I think the ones we'd be talking about are like three hundred and thirty feet, just the tower. Right. And then the um, <clears throat> the blades are like half a football the six, field. Yeah. So, like the sixty. Side, yeah, yeah, do you know yeah, what, like, just the megawatt okay. one, the mega, sure. megawatt turbine that you just used for that calculation? Also. Sure, so the I was going based off of a couple of years ago that I had a statistic that gave me the estimated energy for um, average onshore wind turbines that were two and a half to three megawatts, um, and the technology we were looking into had one size that was eight megawatts and one that was 11 megawatts, so we'd probably select the eight megawatt one since it's a little over... Okay. zealous <laughs> um, but so just I was sort of extrapolating from that um, taking six million kilowatt hours per wind turbine I figure 10 was a conservative estimate for the amount of energy that would be produced by the type of wind turbine that we're looking to install in this area can I have one more nitpicky okay. definition <laughs> just because you picked my county sure. what's your definition of farm for New Hanover County I had a resource that said in 2017 there were 59 farms, and it was from the state itself, so <laughs> unsure. But I see what you're saying. It could be something that you know wouldn't exactly like. It's optimistic. I understand. Yeah. So yeah. not every single farm. I was using it as a um, sort of just to put in perspective the potential that does exist in the county. Um, obviously, when you're actually implementing. I, that maybe we'd be shooting for that average, yeah. and it, it would be unrealistic to have two at every single farm. And awesome. just so the non-North Carolinians know what a farm is in North Carolina, it's a certain it's a certain percentage of your revenue has to be made from mm -hmm. your sourced goods for sale. We don't have fifty nine farms, and the farms we have are actually horse like true farms. Like when you guys think of farms, are horse farms. So, but we have 59 companies making <laughs> their revenue off of growing and producing food products or farm products. Okay. That's awesome. why I was like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And we can continue to debate about this later. <laughs> <laughs> So for our project, we decided to create a mentorship program called Green Hands. But before I start, we're all going to introduce ourselves. So my name's Emma Simperman. I'm a digital marketing major, and I'm from USF. Or I go to USF. <laughs> uh, my name's Dylan Roberts. Um, I'm a senior at UNCW, and I'm an environmental science major. My name is Mandy, and my background is in communication design. My name is Megan Stacy. I go to USF and I'm an environmental science major. My name is Sydney Dumars. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Houston. I major in liberal studies with minors in Spanish, journalism, and energy and sustainability. So we decided to create Green Hands because we um, saw that there were people who come from non-STEM backgrounds that are interested in sustainability but don't know how to get started or transition into the field. So our solution to this was to create a self-paced online mentorship program, giving experts the opportunity to help people transition from non-sustainable to sustainable roles. So we plan on having courses, and each course um, would cover one of the sustainable development goals. But overall, we're working on the fourth one, which is quality education. OK, so this would be the mentorship platform and what it looks like. So we planned on having, again, like a course for each goal. And the course would be. Um, separated into different modules. Each module would contain a refresher, I guess pre-recorded like lecture and a quiz. Since it is self-paced, we don't know like, I guess how long it's taking them. So, and then in the module, there's also gonna be more pre-recorded lectures and then a quiz. You have to receive at least 80% on the quiz to unlock the next module. And then from there, after you complete all the modules, it's gonna be a big assignment, which you will get personalized feedback from that professor. And then once you complete this course, you'll receive a certificate and a letter of recommendation, which Megan will talk more about. 
just give me a hand. And how it works, so the participant would pick an SDG route and then they would pick a level. So there's a one-time program fee, which we'll talk about later. And yeah, so they choose one out of the 17 SDG routes and they ha we have um, different levels like beginner, intermediate, expert, and masterclass. Um, and then they go into this eight-week mentorship program and that includes guided courses, um, assignments, and exams features of industry leaders in the focus area and uh, resume workshop and feedback. Um, and then finally, they'll get a certificate of completion and a personalized uh, recommendation letter and also a referral from their mentor. All right, so this is an example of what it would look like um, looking at sustainable development goal number seven. This was, um, we have a couple different levels here, going from beginner up to master class, which is extra um, money. And so looking at beginner, um, for the goal number seven, it is basically the what, an overview of affordable and clean energy. Um, and then you would have your modules, like Emma explained, um, in the beginner course. And then next, looking at the intermediate one, um, this would be the why, going more in depth about how to help out, looking more at like the geothermal, hydropower, hydropower, solar, wind, um, energy, et cetera. Um, and then looking at the expert level, this is more of like the how, so like how to ensure affordable, reliable, sustainable, and ener or modern energy around the world. And then our master class would be extra, like we said, so it'd be um, about like 500 to $1,000 extra, um, and it is optional. Um, it would be led by the head of the given department for the goal, so for number seven, it would be led by um, someone that like runs or works at a geothermal hydropower plant. Um, and then all of these, the beginner through the expert, have a um, basic certificate and a reference letter that would also come with it, uh, and a recommendation letter um, that would go with it. And then for the master class, you would get a different certificate for that. So if we go to the next one, this is an example. If Jake were to take um, an intermediate level of the goal number seven for affordable and clean energy, he would get a certificate that looks like this. And then um, your referral letters and recommendation letters that um, you would also get as well. All right. Thank you. All righty. So for customer relation or for business relations overall, customer relationship, um, we want to offer customer support, like not just for our customers, but also for our mentors. So. If they have any troubles, we have our number, our email, frequently asked questions page. So maybe some questions are already going to be answered, and any help tech-wise, that'll be there. Um, so social media to give a preview to potential onboardees. And we believe um, what helps the most is having personal feedback and communication with mentors. This way, their questions are um, answered from basic level to a master level. Um, and this way, it's catered to them specifically, and specifically to them and their needs. Um, regarding customer segments, um, we're not looking for, or we'll, ideally, we're looking for people who want to make a difference. So this can be anyone from college student, college students, retirees, um, people looking to switch fields, and many more. This is why we have various levels of experts in niche sustainability fields. Um, we know how difficult it can be to interview when you're, not as co when you're not as competitive against other applicants. So this is why learning and understanding a specific, a sp sorry, <laughs> a specific study at a slower pace um, by a mentor in this field will give them like, an up, uh, like a better hand at it. This is like a professional launch pad into a field sustainability-wise they want to go into. Um, and then our distribution channels. So um, how we're going to get, how we're going to onboard our customers and our mentors. Um, ideally, we're looking at direct emailing and LinkedIn. We're going to see the um, professors, professionals, heads of companies, mostly through LinkedIn. This is how we're going to find their um, years of work experience. Um, as well, having our company and campus partners. This is how we um, also, this is how <clears throat> it serves us well for like professional connections. 
And then again, social media allows us to showcase our mission and achievements um, to current and potential mentees. Okay, so looking at value proposition or what basically what makes our company different from other companies is it's an all-inclusive mis mission to onboard people from non-sustainable backgrounds, so people that may not know a lot about green jobs or just like the sustainability like field in general and then kind of mentor them up and then get them ready for like a sustainable role or like a job kind of. Um, and then offering like a fairly priced option compared to something like a Skillshare or something like a mentorship program in that regard. Um, and then the certificate that you get at the end of the program can be used as a resume bo booster for anybody that's trying to get into a green job field or recent college graduates. Um, and then for rev revenue streams associated with the business, Really, we only have the pricing or the price plan that comes in when you pay for the mentorship program. So we were thinking about $1,000 for the base level, and then each level after that would increase about $500 more. Um, and then to kind of explain, it would be a one-time payment depending on what topic you'd pick. So you'd pick one topic that you'd want to know more about. Um, and you'd pay that $1,000. If the customer decides to do another topic, um, we were thinking that it would be discounted. If they wanted to go back and do another certificate, um, that it would be priced less than the base level. And then um, not on here, we, um, I wanted to talk about the surplus. Um, and basically, any like excess money we got, we were basically going to use to like, expand the amount of mentors we have, the amount of topics that we can do, um, and then expand our um, our PR team, which we will talk about in the next one. So this is our cost slide. All right, our cost slide. So what we're going to be looking for initially, we want to pay for a website to host your service. Then eventually, we're going to want to post it ourselves. So we're going to take somewhere from hundreds to probably thousands of dollars for hosting it ourselves in the future because of maintenance and ownership of the website. We want to hire accredited mentors to teach these online lectures. Um, we're giving like ball, ballpark ranges at the moment. So ideally, it's going to be a percentage of the class and depending on how many students sign up for the class. Um, the public relations and a support team is going to be in a salary range. So um, we're looking anywhere from like $2,000 to $5,000 a month for this. And then again, technology costs. So um, recording software, computers, um, integrating this together for our modules, and again, a website to host overall. Um, and those are the costs what we're looking for. And so overall, that is Green Hands. We like to see this mentorship company as a bridge for people um, with non-STEM or unsustainable backgrounds to, yeah, non-STEM or non-sustainable backgrounds. And ultimately, we're making a space for people um, um, who wants to make a change in the world? <laughs> Any questions? Neha. Um, how do you plan on making this program accessible to people, especially since it is on the pricier side? That is a good question. <laughs> um, we, I, we agree that it is uh, like a bit pricier. Um, there's always like a coupon code option we could um, have in the future, um, but we do see this as like kind of within that range because it is something that would benefit um, people's like career people career wise. Um, but we're definitely going to look at lowering once we're able to. Yes. So I was also thinking um, when we have surplus, we could maybe create like scholarships or something of that sort, too. Um, I don't know who's next. Uh, Can we just in. like pick it? Let's okay. <laughs> um, this. Um, one. So in terms of like, especially are we saying like, one of this being like a cool thing for rem uh, sorry <laughs> resume booster for people that wouldn't traditionally have sustainable things on their resume. Like I think a big part of that is like buzzwords on a resume when they're like scanning through a bunch of them. Like how do I feel like your first big step would be like making a name for your program so it's not just like 
a random credential that like no one's heard of before. So like, what would be the best like tackling that initial, like so that like when a company sees like green hands certificate, like why would they know what that means? Like and tackling that first initial problem. I mean, I think over time through like social media and marketing, like we will build that credential. Like in the beginning, it's going to be hard like any other company. You won't know like who is that, you know? Um, so I think over time that might solve itself. Hit the green program. Oh. So uh, uh, like, sorry. Again, um, what we want is to like to have these courses certified. They're like certifications and that way that proves like credibility for People that want to put it on a resume. Cool. Yeah. A demi? Okay, kind of going off of that a little bit, and also kind of partially a question. Um, is like the beginner level that also costs me a thousand dollars? Like for each specific topic, like the twelve goals, each goal costs a thousand. Yes. Um, <laughs> There's the base. Does you want to? Yeah. So. You're paying, usually you're paying, I think the beginner is the base level, so it would be about 1000 for that. And if you wanted to do another one, it would be a discounted price. We didn't really decide that, but you could go in and get another certificate for less, yeah. And then Wait, and I kind of have a part two, I'm so sorry. Um, for that, would it be like, have you, are you guys are familiar with Khan Academy? Like, I know they mm -hmm. have I think we'd have like a preview to that. That way there'd be some like introduction to these courses. That way once someone does have the money or doesn't want to at that time to like pursue it, they could always do it in the future and there's still like some free option for them. Susanna? That is not just who we're aiming to address, but we're also looking for, like you said, college students, but also anyone that wants to be a part of this and like wants to have like some sustainable niche they want to pursue. Yeah. Um, Could you repeat that? <laughs> so are you expecting people to graduate and then take on this course before they take on the job? Um, does anyone wanna? I can add on to that. Okay. Um, yeah, so it'd be like, it's based towards like college um, people like in, during college, not after they graduate. Okay. Um, so that it's kind of like when you like want to do like a business, but you're like an environmental science major. So, and like, I think you can't minor in a business thing unless you're do majoring in it. So it'd be, you get like a business certificate. This is almost like the same thing. Um, and that's why we made it like more expensive because like college classes and we have to pay like the person to like teach the classes. Um, but yeah, Jake. There's a lot going on here. It's a <laughs> oh, great no. time. I love the whole idea and everything. And I see it as also as you're at this moment of you have this great idea and everything. Price isn't working out right now in this room. There's like a lot of questions about that. <laughs> so maybe some more work there in the future. But there are people that are further along as like in professional development, even companies that they train their staff and provide professional development for them. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing this shift towards in businesses towards professional not towards professional in businesses and companies towards sustainability. And this is a great resource for them to, and they are specific to focus in their area, and I see a great <coughs> pathway forward for that. And I think even at this price point, it kind of fits in with that. But for the youthful, for people younger, uh, maybe not so much, but that public access and at least something to start the way, even <coughs> a lower level for students in college to have a part in it, I think is awesome. Amy, you want to finish us up here? I would, I would just, I would 
com I completely agree. I know you guys are all kind of a little bit in sticker shock, but that is a completely normal price range for a professional development certification. Like lead certification costs at least three thousand dollars. Wetland certification easily costs three thousand dollars. Like this is you guys are actually offering a good product at a slightly smaller price. Um, but to make it even more to make it even more approachable, like like you just said, and some people are kind of petitioning for, um, I would just recommend adding that like sustainability officer and training level or something where you have like that student pricing mechanism that's that in training that level of a, of a certificate. But yeah. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. 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 All right, we're the last team. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, this group is passionate about cities and the role that they can play um, in achieving the sustainable development goals. So we're excited to be able to introduce the Green City Accelerator. Before we dive into the content, we'll do some quick introductions. My name is Whitney Stewart. I graduated from Penn in 2019, and now I'm a business strategy consultant at Accenture in our sustainability practice. I am Daisy Perez. I study environmental science and policy at USF, and I also work with my local county government. My name is Katie Johnson. I'm a senior at UNC Wilmington studying environmental science with uh, two minors in business and biology. My name is Jake Morris. I'm a liberal studies major with an environmental humanities minor at Arizona State. Cool, so just to give you an idea of where we're going, we'll start with the sustainability imperative, driving the need for something like a Green City Accelerator. We'll talk about the business canvas model for the Green City Accelerator, then we'll dive into three cities that we think would be good candidates for us to launch a pilot, and then we'll close out with some Q&A. Now we'll start off with the sustainability imperative. According to the IPCC, if in order for us to achieve or to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, cities are going to need to achieve net zero by 2050. So it only makes sense that, you know, UN Secretary General is right, cities are where the climate battle will largely be won or lost. But why are cities so so important to this, you know, why are they uniquely positioned to usher in a net zero carbon future? Part of it's about demographic changes. Um, the first global population is expected to rise to 9.7 billion by 2050. Second, you know, people are moving from the periphery into the center. Um, of that 9.7 billion, 6.6 .6 billion are expected to live in cities by 2050. And with all of that comes increased rise of energy demand. Um, global energy demand is expected to rise to by 47% by, by 2050. Which leads us to our Green City Accelerator, which addresses four of the 17 sustainable development goals. We have SDG 9, which is focused on infrastructure, 11 focused on sustainable cities and communities, 13 focused on climate action, and 17 bread and butter partnerships for the goals. So in order for us to usher in um, this net zero carbon future, we want to really leverage the power of public-private partnerships. And we plan to do that by proposing a nine-month um, accelerator for cities and startups to come together to pilot the renewable energy solutions that are necessary to achieve net zero um, while addressing some of those critical infrastructure challenges. Yeah, absolutely. Like Whitney just mentioned, our Green City Accelerator Program 
focuses on crumbling infrastructure and have that also have poor energy usage and thus will be uniquely positioned to assist our two customer stakeholders, both our cities and our startup. So our first customer stakeholders are our cities, which will receive a net zero carbon strategy support, execution of our governance support, access to innovative technology, and also a way and an ability to use that technology in their city. Our next customer stakeholder is our startup companies, which will receive training, financial investments, product op optimization, meaning they're able to use their product and also access to our clients and our support through our piloting program. So our next, our customers, partners, and our stakeholders are critical to the success of our operations. Like I mentioned, we have two customers. First, our cities will pay for the strategy and implementations of our consulting services, whereas our startup, they're also our customers, but we will be uh, getting a 10% stake in their company. Our partners include our venture capital firms and our social media influencers, as well as our stakeholders, which include cities, community leaders, local governments, and also the citizens of the communities as well. So, the Green City Accelerator provides programming over the course of nine months total. For the first three months, we will be going through steps one through four. One is to determine the level and source of carbon emissions. Step two is to develop emission reduction targets and KPIs. Three is prioritize initiatives to reduce emissions. And four is to identify key technology enablers. And within step four, um, cities will be matched with startups possessing the capabilities and experience necessary to enable progress toward emission reduction targets. And it, within step five, it will, it will take course over six months, and um, it will be the implementation of the pilot. This will be a project where our technology consultants will work with startups and city officials in order to integrate technology solutions in the context of cities incorporating renewable energies, and it will remain customizable towards different cities. Thank you. So we and the Green City Accelerator will measure success through a defined set of KPIs, and our metrics of success will include the number of startups in our ecosystems, the number of startup IPOs, the start valuation, the number of cities in our ecosystems, and the achievement of each city's startup's pilot um, KPIs. And now to do a uh, quick uh, rundown of the uh, costs, uh, excuse me. Uh, first off, we're talking about uh, startup revenue. Uh, our goal is $1 million in the, fir in the first two years of business, and we are getting that from, again, business, business loans, uh, grants and venture capital. Uh, now it may seem it may seem like a lot, but we have to consider uh, scale and where we want to go. And in comparison with uh, how we looked into this, you know, it seems pretty it seemed like a fair amount for within within two years to shoot to shoot for that goal. And obviously uh, with revenue, uh, we already talked about getting consulting fees from cities, 10% stake, uh, stakes, uh, company stakes from startups, and then business costs. Getting into that more specifically, we're talking about employee salaries. We rough, we estimated that about $50,000 each uh, annually. Uh, we're also considering traveling uh, for for site visits as needed. Uh, we're going to places. We're building. We're building connections. So we may need to travel as as fit. Office supplies here and there. We have to consider that and marketing and that's and that's uh, a big thing right there uh, we are considering social media and digital advertising and advertising in general um, and what resources continuing on what resources will we need to run this uh, sustainability strategy and technology consultants for pilot design and implementation support Access to venture capital for startup costs, access to city officials with budget for sustainability initiatives related to infrastructure, uh, and robust uh, startup ecosystem introducing bleeding edge renewable technology solutions. Uh, continuing on, uh, talking about, again, social, me social media. Um, uh, 
we would be present on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Spotify, talking like about Spotify, um, having ad spots on podcasts, you know, catering to that uh, environmental technology uh, audience and putting putting ads on there. And also our public relations, community outreach, uh, town hall meetings, MBA, MBA startup outreaches. Uh, we are building connections. We want to have good standings within these communities as well. So now that we have talked about our business canvas model, we're also going to go into our next steps, which include our where we're going to be implementing this, our strategic locations. So because this is um, a program, we have decided on three different locations. Our first location is Jersey City. Uh, as Jersey City has increased urbanization, which in contributes to poor air and water quality, and of course, Jersey City has a low dependence on renewable energy, as only 8% of Jersey City's energy is made up of renewable energy, which is solar. Likewise, driving on the roads um, in need of repair in Jersey City, each driver costs about $713 per year, and 7.8 bridges are rated structurally deficient. So Jersey City is a key area that can benefit from the Green Cities Accelerator through their poor usage of renewable energy and also uh, poor roads and other building infrastructures as well. Also, um, we were thinking Philadelphia, Pennsylvania would be a good spot to use this accelerator because um, it is known to have one of the worst traffics in the U.S. Um, almost, or in a recent study, study 300,000 hours of people were stuck in traffic. Um, so who knows what that time could be used for um, for something else, um, as well as the in infrastructure for public schools is continuing to deteriorate throughout the city. Um, the Federation for Philadelphia Federation of Teachers um, was suing its school district because of lack of funding, and um, it was able to collect one billion dollars to fix the schools statewide from the um, governor. Um, but by using renewable technologies in the classroom, it could inspire children and young adults to be interested in green technologies while they're being surrounded by these green technologies in the classroom. Um, as well, during a recent report for Pennsylvania in 2014, the state was below average for many infrastructural institutions like their water, um, wastewater department, their freight rail park system, and hazardous waste treatment all received below average grades. But um, the ability of renewable energies to help with the heating and cooling of schools, buses, and water treatment and transportation could further the spearheading of renewable energies and create the city to be a lot more sustainable. Another uh, city we are considering is Albany. I uh, have to represent New York here. Uh, <laughs> Albany being a mid-sized city and also being close to the Hudson River. Uh, Hudson River uh, having long-standing issues of contamination and pollution. It's always been a huge issue and it's only getting worse. Uh, and with Albany uh, in, the, in the pollution, the sub, uh, sorry, the subjugation of its citizens to this pollution is an apparent example of environmental racism. Uh, these are also issues, uh, this is another issue that we need to, that needs to be addressed by local governments. Beyond structural problems that we've all been talking about, uh, there, are also, there are also social problems surrounding the environment that needs to be considered, and our accelerator can be used to build those healthy foundations. If you don't take that. You want to end that off? Thanks so much for listening. At this time, we will take any questions that you may have. So we, that's like one of the issues that we want to tackle. Um, so they would be the ones coming up with the ideas coming to us to help manufacture how to fix that. Okay, so you guys aren't the ones like coming up with the ideas, you're the ones implementing them, so, kind of? So to, to add a little bit more color, you know, when we're talking to cities um, and to the startups in our ecosystems, We'll go to the, the cities and try to understand what their specific challenges are, what is that prioritized 
list. Um, and then, you know, so what we discussed may not be what they're most interested in. Maybe they want, they want to understand the best way to um, electrify their public transporta transportation, for example, right, and, and address um, emissions from, you know, that, from that angle. Um, and then at that point, we'll connect them to startups um, in, in the region that have the technology that will enable them to achieve that. Key performance indicator. Okay. Yeah. So once you have your your project, it's basically like how like what are, what are we going to measure ourselves by? What's the rubric? Okay. That's it. Shubesh. So for the cost, I saw that you're taking one million dollars in terms of loans for um, innovating to start the project. Um, what's the breakdown? So it's a mix of, so it would be over the next two years. So, you know, you could split it up um, five, 500, 500. Um, so part of it is, you know, just paying ourselves. So you already have 200K out of that 300. Um, we didn't delineate like percentage wise, you know, what's going to go toward um, travel versus marketing, et cetera. But all of those other costs that we delineated would be covered in the rest of that 300K. Um, and then surplus, any surplus could go toward um, supporting um, pro bono efforts for cities that have the desire to um, move toward more sustainable practices, but just don't have um, the budget to do so. Incentives. Can you go back yeah. to that slide, please? So. This one? Yes. Yeah, number three. Oh, prioritize initiatives. Oh, just right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, that's like, so do I'll we want to. Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's a, that's a good question. Um, so some of the can you flip over, please flip over to the um, KPI slides, the metrics of success. Is that before that? I think it's after. I think it's after this one. Okay. So we. So I think like the big one that you might be talking about in the context of a pilot would be the achievement of those like the pilot KPIs. Um, I think for for something like that. We would try to manage that as best as possible by like creating a roadmap that will allow us to um, plan for any risks that that are involved. Um, and you know, if in the worst case, then we would need to um, talk about extending the the timeline a little bit more um, to make sure that we're able to, to to hit those. But you know, best case, the KPIs should be something that are. They should be ambitious, but achievable. Okay. Awesome. Let's give them a round of applause. Good job, team. OK, before you, I'll be done in 30 seconds for to stand back. Awesome. OK. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, these were all. Great presentations. They were all diverse and so different. Uh, and I'm really proud of you all for that. Um, yes, we can all clap for each other. Thank you for having me back. Uh, these were amazing. I can't believe where you all came from from day one to where we are with everyone's different backgrounds and experiences and things. It's been amazing. So I'm so glad to have you here for this. And you should
shall be proud of yourself. Thank you. Thank you.